Excellent. Right. So I'm John Aldersey Williams. Uh, I'm working with Progressive Energy, that is a net zero project developer working across the UK. Uh, and in part, I'm here because we're doing some work with Spirit Energy, uh, looking what at, at what the Morecambe gas fields could could be like in a, in a net zero world. But the focus I've been asked to to, to make is is hydrogen. So I want to just run through a couple of slides to talk about. What is it? Why is it important? Uh, what contributions it going to make to the net zero world? Because obviously, uh, as Paul said, we, we're still going to need energy in one form or another, and and it's likely that those the main forms of that will be electricity, and also we believe hydrogen. So hydrogen is just a gas, just like just like the natural gas you currently get out of your your gas boiler. Um, it's actually the most abundant molecule in the universe, um, but it's it's not uh, terribly ubiquitous. Well, it's kind of ubiquitous on earth everywhere on earth but only generally in the form of water the great thing about hydrogen from a from a, a net zero perspective is when you burn it you don't get any carbon dioxide coming out of it the only byproduct of burning hydrogen is water uh, and for the purpose of this conversation it's it's a particular interest because there is an opportunity for barrow and for cumbria more generally in the emerging hydrogen economy i'll call it so what can you do with hydrogen uh, as, as a gas? You can burn it just like natural gas. Uh, so um, even now in the UK, there are trials going on where hydrogen is being blended into the natural gas being provided into people's homes and used to provide heat and hot water and cooking energy. Uh, and that's demonstrating that it is, is safe and effective uh, as a blend in natural gas. And, and I think we'll expect to see that rolled out more widely. In the longer term, uh, the national the, the national gas company called Nas National Grid Gas uh, is looking at the potential to repurpose the existing gas pipelines in the country uh, for carrying 100% hydrogen. So, so to shift from, as we did from town gas to North Sea gas, to shift again from North Sea gas into hydrogen as this new clean energy source. You can also use hydrogen as a as a precursor chemical to to liquid fuels like ammonia, uh, which you could potentially use to power ships. Uh, and as Paul said as well, you could also potentially convert it back into methane to use existing technologies that are configured to burn methane. And the final thing you can do with hydrogen is you can burn it when you need to, um, as long as you've got it um, stored somewhere. So when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining and your batteries are run down, you can still generate electricity by burning hydrogen. And that's part of the kind of systems modeling that Paul's been talking about as, as part of the, the conundrum that we all face. So you heard on, on Lauren's slides, so you saw blue and green hydrogen mentioned. So I thought I'd just take a minute to explain those two different things because they're blue hydrogen and green hydrogen are indistinguishable when they come out of your cooker. Um, it's just, the, these are uh, names we use to describe where they've come from. And blue hydrogen we get from reacting natural gas like North Sea gas with steam in a, in a chemical process uh, from which the results are hydrogen and carbon dioxide in two clear separate streams. And we can capture 97% or more of the CO2, the carbon dioxide that results from that and store it in the carbon capture and storage kind of project that Lauren mentioned on one of her slides. That's a large scale technology right now. Um, and it's a proven technology. And right now it is a lower cost per unit of hydrogen technology than the alternative, which I'll talk about in a second. The cost of that uh, process and the cost of the hydrogen arising from it is strongly governed by the, the price of natural gas. So at the moment, uh, it's, it's taking a bit of a, uh, having a bit of an issue because gas prices, as we all know, rather painfully are expensive at the moment. Uh, but in general terms and, uh, and at what I want to call more normal gas prices, uh, it is significantly cheaper than the alternative green hydrogen. The other left, thing, sorry? A minute left, John. Very good. The other, the other attractive thing about blue hydrogen is you can switch your plants up and down in response to demand. The other kind, green hydrogen, uh, uses renewable electricity from, for example, wind farms to split water in, back into hydrogen and oxygen. And the very attractive thing about that is there aren't any CO2 emissions from that process and no carbon dioxide. But at the moment, that's a smaller scale process. <clears throat> it's more expensive at the moment than, than blue hydrogen. Uh, and its cost is driven by the electricity price. And, and as Paul said, the costs of 
electricity, for example, from offshore wind have been coming down over the last decades as people have got better at it uh, and made it bigger. The one uh, difficulty with green hydrogen is, as the final point here is, is effectively you need a store for it because as you make it, when the wind is blowing, you need to store it because when the wind is blowing isn't necessarily when you need it. So you will, not, will need stores for that. And the final point that isn't on this slide is, is the Morecambe Bay gas field assets are very well configured to be both CO2 storage sites uh, for the long-term permanent storage of carbon dioxide from anywhere in the UK or further afield, and potentially also for the shorter term large scale storage of hydrogen to balance supply and demand. So that's a five minute gallop through, through hydrogen. Uh, I'm available in breakout rooms for as much detail as you want.